democratic dispensation, as it is known in South Africa, is the third dispensation we've had since unification in 1910. It seems by all accounts to be falling apart. For years now, people have been questioning the constitution, and the nation is gripped by political infighting and the looming possibility of a third president pushed out of office during term. Roads are in tatters, autos shut off, blackouts roll across the electrical grid, and political assassinations are frequent. And yet, at the last election cycle, the people voted by a very clear margin to keep the ANC in power. The smart money is on the ANC losing their majority in this coming election, but many people might ask what took them so long. Can't the people tell what is going on around them? I would argue that the ordinary voter is not completely deluded. They simply understand South Africa differently from westernized elites. South Africa is not a Western parliamentary democracy with a rotating cavalcade of slightly dissimilar managerial elites. We vote for dispensations. What the average voter is voting for is for non-apartheid. They do not understand political parties as being temporary managers, but as organizers of a holistic system. And the system must be pretty broken to make a South African go shopping for a replacement. For those of you not acquainted with our use of the term, a political dispensation is a system of government based on a dominant consensus position on key goals and values, held together by a grand narrative which excludes competing value systems. Many external features of the formal constitution can change or remain the same, but the substance of government becomes radically different under the control of a new political dispensation. It is the rhythm of these slow but monolithic changes which give us our understanding of politics. Before we weigh up the crimes of the state, it is important to understand the logic of its moral order and the rules of political engagement. For South Africans, much of the facts will be old hat and fairly uncontroversial. But it is in the shape of the narrative that we can perceive the possibilities for different futures. This is the story behind each dispensation and the philosophies it relied on to maintain power. It is also the story of the roads not taken and the futures not lived. It will end with a fork in the road as we look forward to next year and the most important political election for a generation. Before South Africa was a country, it was a patchwork of Boer republics, roaming pastoralists, African feudal states and British colonial possessions. In the middle of this mess, a British boy by the name of Cecil John Rhodes built up one of the world's greatest mineral empires from humble beginnings as an ice cream salesman to sweaty English miners at Kimberley. He set out to create a unified British Africa and offer the vote to every civilized man south of Zambezi. He was Prime Minister of the Cape Colony for nearly seven years. Together with business companions Alfred Byte, Charles Rudd and Leander Jameson, he set up a secret society designed to control the world and spread the beneficence of English rule, and created a private fiefdom encompassing modern-day Zambia and Zimbabwe. After a large capital injection from Lord Rosebery and Nathan Rothschild, he recruited members of high establishment to his society, including Lord Milner, who sat on the Queen's Privy Council and served as Minister of War. After the Witwatersrand became a magnet for miners during the gold rush, Paul Kruger, President of the Transvaal Republic, restricted citizenship and taxed foreigners heavily, eventually requiring 17 years residence. After subsidising English influx for years to attempt a ballot box coup, out of frustration, Rhodes sent his friend Jamison to assault Johannesburg with private Rhodesian troops and called on Milner to pressure the empire into war. After a brutal three-year slaughter, all of South Africa was conquered in 1902. When a statue was erected of Cecil Rhodes on the site of the university funded by the endowment declared in his will, young Afrikaners protested but failed to have it removed. After the Boer War, the Cape and the three former Boer republics were united under a single constitution in 1910, written single-handedly by the philosopher, Boer War general and global statesman Jan Smuts. The aim of government was first and foremost to heal the divisions between Boer and Brit and create a stable political identity. 
While Smuts's South African party were not always in power during this period, the avoidance of national disunity was seen as paramount, and due to the government of national unity, Smuts was in government for all but four years, from 1910 until 1948, and his thoughts dominated the intellectual landscape. Smuts assented to the spiritual unity with the British Empire, while simultaneously demanding greater local autonomy as a member of what is called the Commonwealth Dominions, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, and fought for the British in the Great War. After defeating the Germans in 1915 in what is now Namibia, it was incorporated and would remain part of South Africa until 1990. The black population mostly lived in areas outside the reach of colonial government, territories run by traditional authorities, who were subject to political pressures from the white state. In the period immediately following the Boer War, Smuts negotiated a handsome settlement considering his weak bargaining position, and it was ultimately said that the Boers had lost the war but won the peace, securing enough confidence from London to be handed autonomous government. Afrikaans and English were given equal footing in all areas of public life, and there was fierce contention over appearances of excess loyalty to either Afrikaans folk or British crown. While Smuts was recognised as a war hero, to many he had given up too much to the British, and his admiration for the empire and British liberalism rubbed the Afrikaners the wrong way. To this day there is a simmering resentment between Anglo and Afrikaner in many parts of the country, sustained by the memory of the brutality of the British scorched earth tactics and concentration camps, which decimated the female and infant population as well as tens of thousands of black labourers. Smuts spearheaded the guerrilla campaign after conventional Boer forces were defeated, forcing the British to offer a peace settlement after two years. The way he and General Buerta saw it, if they didn't stop fighting, the British would have eradicated them. Despite his personal sacrifices, which included spending two years sniping at British soldiers from muddy ditches, Smuts was seen by some as a Volkverayar, a traitor to the people, for agreeing to the settlement. This negative image came as a result of his actions in government as well as a private admiration for the British Empire, which he saw as an instrument to global integration, part of his grand philosophy of holistic evolution. The Union era saw a large influx of people from British colonies, including numerous Indians, who now constitute the largest population of Indians outside of India. As Prime Minister and head of the South African Party, Smuts ruthlessly put down the Maritz Rebellion, an Afrikaner nationalist attempt to prevent troops being sent to defend British interests in the First World War, and the Rand Rebellion, a violent effort by the South African Communist Party and their white unions in the Witwatersrand mines to campaign for a white South Africa, defending themselves against black urbanization and equal racial employment opportunities in the mines. These policies, interpreted as disloyalty to his people, resulted in him losing his office in 1934. But in an attempt to avoid Brudertwes, or strife between Afrikaners, he convinced Barry Herzog to merge his national party with the South African party, to form the United Party. And Smuts was almost continually in executive government from 1914 until 1948, and led the nation through both world wars. But this uneasy alliance required the passing of several laws to appease white communities. Like other Western governments after the war, Smuts gave the franchise to working men and to women as a means of pacifying the working classes. This new arrangement created a racial asymmetry in what was until that point considered a fair system, the non-racial Cape franchise. Before, big men like John X. Merriman and Smuts himself had favoured a gradual paternal and developmental approach to eventual racial integration, called trusteeship. But by handing the vote to all whites, yet only a tiny, fixed and unrepresentative minority of non-white voters, they were forced to acknowledge a different game, a transition to a new dispensation. In a democracy, franchise cannot be withdrawn from one's constituents, only expanded, and so their choice was to either embrace racial equality on the ballot and a potential violent Afrikaans uprising or compromise by offering separate development. The pressure was considerable and the presence of Afrikaner nationalist terrorist groups like the Osava Brandwach was considered a serious cause of concern. The state soon was forced under popular pressure on the coalition government 
to consolidate an exclusively white franchise. This was triggered by a paranoia about white women being employed by Indian shopkeepers, but soon escalated into a full spate of racialist legislation. In 1936, the Native Land Act and Native Representation Act were passed to appease the Afrikaans' right by stripping the franchise and property rights from non-whites in most of the country's area, offering a limited local political autonomy in the homelands. These bills were voted through unanimously, with the single exception of Jan Hendrik Hofmeyer, who made several enemies by objecting in strong moral terms on the basis of his Christian belief to the retraction of the franchise from loyal subjects and was mocked as a vain idealist. Smuts and Hofmeyer also attempted to provide refuge for millions of refugees from Europe during the Second World War, but failed to achieve a parliamentary majority. Jan Smuts himself believed that the races did not have any real genetic differences, but that acculturation was required to bring black Africa into the modern world, the development of their human personality, as he called it. Africa was underdeveloped and needed a white aristocracy to guide them. As to integration, he was rather reluctant to meet the challenge and unwilling to face the reality of sharing power with black South Africa, who were almost entirely illiterate, shared little in common with white South Africa and had deep blood feuds to settle. They had spent the prior three centuries crossing swords and muskets with each other. And unlike North America or Australia, the settlers had not decimated the native population, merely displaced them, and were vastly outnumbered even then. The general population felt at so basic a level that it was never necessary to articulate openly that letting Africans into their political system would mean its utter collapse. The Lager mentality was thus a unanimous attitude. So Smuts kicked the can down the road. In private writings, Smuts acknowledged that grand segregation was impractical and black urbanization was irresistible. When the notorious Fagan report came out in 1948, and trumpeted this opinion from the rooftops, Smuts confirmed his recognition of it and fell into public ignominy with his people. Already raging at the betrayal of the support for the British war effort in World War II, confirming decades-long Afrikaner suspicions of his dual loyalties, Smuts was soundly defeated in the 1948 elections by the newly resolute hard-right Nationalist Party, chaired by a man from his own hometown, Francois Malan. Far from promoting a lasting harmony and ever closer unity, Smuts's compromises guaranteed the arrival of Grand Apartheid. In 1947, a year before this defeat, South African author Arthur Keppel Jones published a famous novel predicting the consequences of the loss of Smuts and his role as a national figurehead. He imagined a world in which Afrikaans Republicans seized power in a grand election, declared independence from the crown, and erected a massive totalitarian fascist state apparatus. After a couple of decades of governance, the nation falls gradually into civil war, and as the Afrikaner government refuses to accept reality, extreme bloodshed in Zululand is followed by a black nationalist takeover. A mass exodus of ethnic minorities ensues, and the nation proceeds on a long bitter path of ruin before finally being placed under the United Nations mandate, as the Bitterrenders flee to Argentina and Central Africa. Reality soon began to harmonize with this prediction. Smuts died shortly after losing the 1948 election and with him a great deal of the spiritual unity of the nation evaporated. Gone were the notions of compromise and coalition. Instead, a long period of gerrymandered ethnic dominance solidified the control of a single party and a single ethnic group. In the next episode, we will be dealing with the second dispensation, Afrikaner nationalism, also known as apartheid. One occasionally hears idle words about the decay of this country, about the approaching breakup of the great group uh, which we form. What folly and ignorance.